thank you for the feedback, by the way. It was very helpful. Um, I think um, most of you um, told me that I should have more stuff, sort of live MATLAB as opposed to writing on the whiteboard. And I'm going to try and do that if I'm, like, at some point here in the whiteboard. Please stop me and tell me to come back to Mat MATLAB. Sometimes when I'm in the swing of things, I really forget. For the notes, um, I don't know. I see who has printed them out. I just generally, it might be helpful. The idea with having the notes is that if you print them out beforehand or even on your computer, then you can keep adding stuff that you want to add to them, and then you can just study from them um, later on or just to have these notes later on for to reference after the class is over. Just the setup. Um, was the reading helpful for... Has the reading been helpful generally? I don't know how many of you have been doing the first reading and the second reading or so. How many of you are familiar with stiff equations or something that, is that generally something new? Well, it'll be good if it's new then. Um, okay, so just generally the, um, the open edX format is pretty much similar required readings. My lecture notes are up there and files. There's a practice problem which might make um, some sense after we go through the lecture today. I'll, we, may, we may, if we have time, we can come back to it. We can, we can go through the sort of the answers in office hours, or if everybody's having troubles with it, we can go through it. Back form is also here, so please fill that out after. Um, it's just generally, I know that it's a lot to ask to have feedback every, after every single recitation, but in the beginning, I want to make sure that we at least attain the steady state style that we can, I can sort of provide in the best possible fashion. That's why I, I really appreciated the feedback last night. So. Okay, so we have MATLAB set up, good. Um, so, okay, so what we're going to do today are three different things. We're going to talk about Simulation of data with noise. Okay, so you can imagine that that has to do a lot with random number generators, and we'll be talking about them. Talking about, I know in Marcus's class, you've probably done a lot of OD45. Um, we're so going to be talking about OD15 as a slightly different solver and why you might find the need for that. Then we'll be talking about this concept of compartmental modeling, and we'll be seeing how that's useful in bioengineering or biomedical engineering problems. And again, uh, just to reiterate, the idea here is to sort of, you know, enable you to be able to um, think about different biomedical engineering applications and sort of think about these things in that context. It's not, I'm not emphasizing or going to emphasize theory in this class, but rather just the application, sort of the engineering cap. Um, so, okay, so, so let's jump right into it. So, we're going to be talking about three different random number gen... They're just linked onto OpenEdX. So. so there are three different random number generator functions that we'll be concerned ourselves, concerning ourselves with. So that's rand, rand n, and rand i. Just going to do a quick sort of help on these functions in MATLAB here. Um, Rand. This is basically going to give you, let's see, it's going to give you a random number from a uniform distribution. Does everybody know what a uniform distribution is? So if you have a uniform distribution, distribution between 0 and 1, there's an equal probability of getting a number anywhere between 0 and 1. Right? If you look at the statistical distribution, it's just a flat line. Right? And you can ask it to give you sort of an array of numbers if you want. You can ask it to give you a single number. For a single number, you don't have to specify any argument. You can just do rand and then just empty braces and then get a single number. Yeah. I think, I guess, generally speaking, I want you all to remember that these are random number generators in the case of computers are never com truly random. They're pseudo-random. And there are much more complicated random number generators than these, which are more random than these. But a lot of the, um, it's just, we're not going to get into the exact mathematical relationships of how these are derived. But it's something important to remember that if you actually save the starting state of the random number generator, 
and you generate 100 random numbers, and then you restore that state, and then you generate another 100 random, number, uh, random numbers, then they'll be actually the same. So that's something important to keep in mind, that there, there's no such thing as a true random number. Um, so that's RAND, uniform distribution. RAND n is for, you can again do help RAND n, and that is going to, I'm just going to tell you, that gives you a um, random number picked from the, what's called the standard normal distribution. Does anybody know what the standard normal distribution is? Mean of zero and one, and what's the character of the distribution? Yeah, Gaussian normal, right? Is that familiar territory? Okay. Um, also, it's one other property, I guess, of the standard normal that we haven't exactly talked about. What would be the integral of that? Yeah, well, the integral of the standard normal would just be if you integrate from minus infinity to infinity, just one. Um, okay, so that's that. So two, and then the third one, which also might be useful at some point, is just rand i. And rand i is just, you can specify a range of numbers, say one to 10, and it's gonna give you random integers from one to 10. Okay, so that's, that's useful. All of these functions can give you single numbers or arrays, like whole matrices, like if you want a two by two matrix of uniform random numbers on the distribution zero to one, you can use RAND directly for that. Now, how do you get random numbers with other ranges? For example, how would you generate a random value from a uniform distribution? Well, one comma three instead of zero comma one. So you look at the size of this interval, which is two. So you know, multiply your RAND with two and so this has the range zero comma two now. Does that make sense? And then you just add one, and so then that has the range one comma three. Does that make sense? You can easily shift these around. I don't think so. There might be in RAND. Um, they do it traditionally. Uh, probably look at the help very quickly. Yeah, I don't see any parameters of right here, but so, I mean, it's, yeah, so that's how usually I do it. For Gauss, is that, I mean, but this makes sense, right? And then for a Gaussian distribution, again, we talked about how rand n is mean zero, standard deviation one. If I want to get, say, mean two, standard deviation three, I'll do three times rand n, and that'll give me mean zero, standard deviation three, right? And then I add two, so everything shifts, and so then it's two. Does that, does that make sense so far to everybody? There are a lot of other probability distributions, as you might have seen in statistics classes, you know, Poisson, exponential, all the sorts of stuff. MATLAB can accommodate all of them. So Poisson has a special poise rand function, which is sort of like the rand n function. But in the case of poise rand, I think you specify the parameter of the Poisson distribution, which is basically the lambda, you know, which is, which is the parameter characterizing the Poisson distribution. For the exponential, you do that of x rand. And then there's also this function, which is itself called random. And there you can actually specify the name of the distribution. You can just go to help random, and you can see all the distributions that MATLAB can give you random numbers from. And then you can use that, generally speaking, to get any random number. Any questions so far? Does that make fairly reasonable so far? Everything? So then the central limit theorem. How many of you know what the central limit theorem is? As the sample size goes to infinity, it'll approach a Gaussian distribution, right? So um, does that make sense to everybody? So the way it, I think, another way of looking at it is if you have, if you have, say, you know, a huge collection of random variables belonging to any statistical distribution, right? So they could be sampled from Poisson, they could be sampled from, you know, um, exponential. If you start taking their mean, right, or even just their sum, <laughs> Then, um, then you look at the statistical distribution of the sum or of the mean of those, of that collection of random variables, that distribution would be a normal distribution. Does that make sense? So I just wanted to demonstrate that here quickly, and this will help you understand both RAND and RAND N2. So say RAND 1, 100,000, you can imagine that that's 
a vector of 100,000 elements, right, which can represent one random variable, right? So it's like, you can think of it as just the distribution, right? I have sampled 100,000 elements from the uniform distribution, so it's giving me a fairly good idea of one random variable which has a uniform distribution. Does that make sense? Right? So now my question is, how many such random variables do you need to get the standard normal distribution, right? So I can, you know, theoretically, of course, you need an infinite. I want to know for practical purposes, say, how many such random variables do I need to get to a normal distribution. Does that make sense so far? Everybody with me? Please ask right now, because this is going to get a little hairier as we go through. Okay. So then, um, I'm just defining again, this is sort of what I was telling you about not hard coding. I've defined everything I need here, right? I've talked about this sample n, which is just that. Number is, this is about how many such random variables, so that is going to be between 1 and 16. I'm going to say, I'm going to guess that 16 is good enough, right? And then bin centers, this will come up later when I'm drawing histograms. This is, these are just some variables I've defined here. Now, I'm going to compare the normal distribution I get from summing up a lot of uniform random numbers to the rand n function, okay? Because the rand n I know comes from the standard normal distribution. So I'm just going to sum up a lot of uniform random numbers and see how many of those random num uniform random numbers I need till I start approximating a rand n. And I want to talk about the hist command. You can see what the hist command does here is it's going to, I'm going to specify this huge vector of, you know, random number values and then basically the bin centers I want, it's going to give me a histogram with as many bins as I've asked for. If you don't specify an output variable, hist actually makes a plot for you. If you specify an output variable, it's going to give you the frequencies in each of the bins that you specified. There's a, another function called bar, which we'll talk about. So then what I'm doing here is much I obtain. So I sum up. So what is this for loop doing? Can anybody tell me what this for loop is doing? Or just actually just this inner for loop? Do you have any sense of what that's doing here? Right, so, yeah, so does that make sense? So for 1, 6, 11, and 16, different random variables, I'm going through each one. So when I have six different random variables, then six times I will be adding rand 1 comma sample n to itself, which means I'm basically summing up six random variables with the uniform distribution. Then I further treat this, I divide this by number i, which is to do what? That is to take the mean, right? Then I do minus 0.5, which is to do what? Anybody, any guesses? Set the mean to zero, right? And then I multiply it by this weird looking number. Why do I do this, any guesses? Yeah, so square root, so one over 12 is actually the standard deviation of uniform distribution. And then I'm correcting that with uh, the fact that, you must have seen this before, is that as you, um, you know how with Gaussians, when you add Gaussians, you get sigma square over n becomes the error. So that's correcting for that n, right? And then I'm going to plot this resultant distribution I get, right? And on the same figure, or actually, and so, so I plot that. And then the other thing I do is I will re-bin it and normalize it. And the reason I'm going to re-bin it is because in this case, I haven't specified the bin center, so it's just going to pick a default number of bin centers. There's, I've just specified here the vector. So I tell it now, give me the same bin centers as what I use for my normal distribution. So I just make that. And note that bar can be used with the frequency data. So if you tell bar the bin centers and the frequency data, then it can plot the histogram for you. So just remember the difference between hist and bar. So when I do that, at something like this. So the idea is this is corresponds to having just one uniform random variable, as it makes sense that the experimental distribution I obtain is just like a uniform distribution. As I go through, you can see that by the time I hit 16, I'm pretty close to the actual normal distribution. 
go through this example on your own. Um, if there are any questions right now, I can answer them. But sort of j just the general intuition is everybody sort of on this following what's going on. The technical details, maybe you can also look back. Does, do people know about DFIT tool? I wanted to also briefly mention that. It's a quick way of, um, so I'm just gonna quickly tell you, it's a quick way of, so you, it's just a use GUI that MATLAB has by default in itself. So this comes up when I enter DFIT tool, and then you say data, and distribution mean here in this case contains my this is for n is 16, for 16 random variables. This is, I just knew this from before. This is what my distribution looked like because this was the last variable in the workspace that I had. You can just say create data set here. And then you can just literally fit. And then you can also do a bunch of fittings here. So it's just a quick GUI way in MATLAB to be able to do fitting, okay? Something that might be useful. DFIT tool, you can just fit, it'll give you some of the values scanned there. Okay? Cool. Central limit theorem, we did that. We talked about hist and bar. Again, hist is used if you have, you know, a bunch of values from a distribution and you want to just bin them and display the data. For bar, you actually have the frequency for the different bins already with you, and then you use it to plot the histogram. Those are different, right? In one case, you have the entire vector of just sample the values. In the other case, in bar, you have the actual frequencies in different bins, and then you plot that. So far, so good? So now, this is my question to you. How would you view this command now? What does this command mean? If I just tell you mean a rand of one comma hundred thousand, in relationship to a normal distribution, how would you interpret this? So think of this as so mean of a hundred thousand. Uniform random variables. That's what I get from this. So what is that? It, it's it's one. It's a sampling from a normal distribution, right? This is just one number. So this is a sampling from a normal distribution. And what normal distribution is it a sampling from? Is it the standard normal? Point to point five. Does that make sense? Because the mean in this case of the random dis of the uniform distribution is 0.5. So when you take the mean of like 100,000 such variables, the mean is not going to shift. You would expect that, right? Just generally throughout the whole Gaussian part of it. If I take a lot of random numbers and I take the mean of them, you would expect that to be 0.5, right? If the distribution is 0 to 1. So it's a sampling from a Gaussian distribution with mean 0.5. And what's the standard deviation of that Gaussian distribution? So it'll be calculated using sigma squared by n, where you have sigma squared is 1 over 12, and n would probably be 100,000. That'll be the variance, and then for standard deviation, you'll take the square root of that. Does that make sense? It's a weird way of looking at this, but that's what it is, actually. Right. So far, so good? OK, so we've talked a lot about theoretical stuff, and I want to mention some engineering application to this. And we'll come back to this example very shortly again. It's actually one of the things I did in my undergrad was um, using this technique called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Has anybody heard of that technique? I see a nod, so. Okay, um, okay. Um, any, any buzzwords you want to throw out? Anything that you think it means? Yes? So that, that's a specific type of MRS, hyperpolarized, what they do here at Stanford, too. Um, so think of NMR on an MRI image. That's what MRS is. So you can, for each voxel, you can do an NMR, OK? So which means that you have the chemical constitution of everything in that voxel. Right? That's what MRS is. 
done, it can be done in humans in vivo, right? Which is really cool. And it's used traditionally, you, would, you don't give radioactive substances in the case of MR, you give sort of um, substances which have this quantum property called spin, and carbon-13 is something which is used which is not radioactive, for example, often. And what you'll do is you'll take a substrate for metabolism, say acetate or glucose or something, that's labeled with C13 at a specific position, and then you'll just have basically an infusion of that constantly going in, and then you know that glucose, acetate, et cetera, these participate in various biochemical cycles in the body, right? The TCA cycle, you know, the, you know, all sorts of biochemical cycles in the body. And so you would expect that when, say, something is getting metabolized to, through the TCA cycle, you would see enrichment of the TCA cycle intermediates, right? The metabolites in, involved in the TCA cycle to get more and more C13 over time. And you can actually measure that, those C13 curves. And from that, you can derive how fast is the TCA cycle in this human being. Pretty amazing, right? This is a very cellular measurement that you're getting from MR. And you can do this in humans. You can actually measure the rate of the TCA cycle and a lot of other different biochemical processes. A lot of metabolism has been worked out through MRS, right? It has, I mean, it has, of course, limitations in terms of the sensitivity not being good, so on. But why is this related to sort of simulating data with noise, it's related because, um, so once you get these time courses from MR spectra, you can imagine a lot of NMR spectra, you get sort of labeling over time of, with 13C, then you actually make a metabolic model. And you, by the end of this class, you'll be actually able to make such models where you basically have equations describing the TCS cycle and the flux of this 13C substrate, right? And then you fit it to the data you're getting, right? And then you get those TCA cycle parameters and other biochemical parameters, right? And where simulation of data comes in, so once you've obtained your fit, you have an estimate of the standard deviation in your data, right? And then you'll just keep adding that standard deviation to your data maybe like 500 times and 1,000 times and repeat parameter estimation every single time, right? And so you use these tools to do that, and then you'll have like a histogram of your parameter values, which will tell you whether your technique, whether you're being able to reliably and precisely measure your parameters. That did not make any sense at all, did it? No? Okay, we're gonna try again. So is everybody with me as far as the gist of MRS is concerned in terms of what this technique is doing? That you're getting 13C labeling curves for various intermediates in the TCA cycle. You've learned these intermediates like citrate, alpha-ketoglutarate, glutamate, all these succinate, you've learned these different intermediates, right? And so you can imagine that you have sort of kinetics of these different intermediates, right? And the kinetics, the time courses of these different intermediates would tell you how fast the TCA cycle is running, right? If the TCA cycle is running extremely fast, labeling would be extremely fast. If the TCA cycle is running slowly, labeling would be slower, right? So it should make intuitive sense that by doing fitting of the experimental data, we can actually get the rates, these rates, and we'll be doing that in this class to some degree. So what I'm saying now is that apart from estimating the rates from an experimental time course, it is important, right, to be able to say how precisely do I know this metabolic rate, right? You want to know the sensitivity of your parameter. You want to know if just one data point was to be switched around, whether your met metabolic rate would be like three times what you've estimated it to be. That's a bad thing, right? right? It shouldn't be very sensitive. And so the way you do that is once you've fitted your experimental time course, then you just go in and pretty much just add Gaussian noise to it separately in a lot of different iterations. And once you've done, and each time you add that noise to it, you estimate the parameters again. So you get different values for their parameters. So if you've done 1,000 different separate individual additions of random noise, you'll get 1,000 different parameter values each time. And then you can make a histogram of that and calculate what the spread in that parameter is, which can tell you, oh, actually I'm not at all sensitive to measuring that parameter, for example. And so my value for this parameter that I've estimated from this data set it doesn't mean anything. Right? And so that's how, and that's one of the applications where simulation of data with noise is important in the biomedical engineering realm. That made a little bit more sense. So, so 
So, so it's about, again, sensitivities of estimated parameters. You can get that from simulation. So moving on, um, OD solvers, any questions? Any questions? So, so what you do is basically, so you have, the question was where does this data come from, right? So you're basically able to, I'm not going to get too much in the details, but you design pulse sequences in MR where you're literally doing, as I mentioned before, like, so you define, say I want to measure the liver, the liver is here, I define an image area in the liver that I'm interested in, then corresponding to each voxel, I can actually acquire some, what, something similar to an NMR spectrum. I average them spatially, right? And then I have this massive spectrum. And over time, if you look at, say, the peak for some intermediate that you're interested in, that peak would keep going up and up in the spectrum, right? And so you measure, you can measure the peak area, you can measure the peak height or something like that, and then you can actually just make a plot. And then you do fitting to that plot. actually share with you my code for one of my data cycle model. We'll talk about the ODEs later on. But that you'll see what sort of these equations look like. Pretty cool though, right, in terms of being able to determine like these very cellular parameters from such like a bulk experiment on like an actual human. That's very rare that you can get such parameters from humans. And so you can imagine the applications of that, right, to diabetes, to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, to setting exercise, how exercise affects us, right? All sorts of metabolism problems which might be otherwise very complicated to handle. Okay, OD solvers in MATLAB, shifting gears a little bit from simulation of data with noise. OD45 is probably a review for most of you, so I'm not, I'm actually not even going to go through it. Uh, we sort of, um, I expect you to be able to read up on it again. What I am going to talk about are stiff systems. So, the, the reading was pr primarily also on stiff systems, and I'm not going to go into the theory of stiff, stiff systems, but I want you to understand that you know how in, and you, I think you implemented like a Rangakuta method back in Marcus's class, right? So um, you know how there's, there's this estimation of a step size involved in numerical integration using ODE solvers, right? And this step size, even in ODE 45, can change, right? But you can imagine that if you have a differential equation where the dependent variable y is such that it has a component that varies over a very long time scale, right? And it has a component that varies over also a very short time scale, so it's got some transient behavior, right? And that it has to do the computations for both of those components. If the integrator has to do computations for both of these components all the time, Right? then it'll end up taking very, very small steps. Right. Because it has to get all the transient behavior. It has to be able to record all the transient behavior in addition to getting the longer term component. Which means that even for the longer term component, it's probably going to take very, very, very small steps. Intuitively, what that means is, um, so in general, it's hard to, you can't just say based on some of the mathematical definitions, you can't come up with stiff systems. At least, I, 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 there's no easy way to come up with a stiff system, but you can sort of, um, uh, to predict a stiff system, but you can sort of uh, understand them once you encounter them. And I'll tell you how you, when you encounter them. So in general, um, so yes, yeah, so we were talking, so in more sort of, in terms of functions you've seen, you can think of an exponential, right? If I have a function which is e to the power minus thousand t, as opposed to something which is e to the power minus 0.1t, the e to the power minus 1,000t is going to be like a transient, right? It's a very fastly decaying function as opposed to the e to the power minus 0.1t, right? It's gonna decay very, very slowly. Does that make sense? And so if you have some complicated system involving such vastly differing signals, you can imagine that the ODE, the ODE step size calculation can get mixed up, right? and that you end up taking very, very, very short step sizes, even the, the time interval over which you need to integrate is huge. And so OD45 actually breaks down their 
it will give you a solution, but it'll take a very, very, very long time. And there are special um, solvers in MATLAB. The most important one for you to know about is OD15S, which help you solve those systems. Now, when do you know, this is a, going back to the question of when you sort of figure out you have a stiff system, if OD, so you can do some rough um, calculations as your reading suggested regarding the Jacobian matrix, right, which was talked about in your reading. Um, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that right now, um, but we can talk about it after class. But you can do some rough calculations. Otherwise, the ballpark rule, if OD45 is not working, it's too slow as compared to what you expect, switch it to OD15S and see what's going on. There are some rough math calculations that you can also do to justify your, the switch, and we can talk about that after class. I don't, if we start talking about linear algebra right now, we're just not gonna finish. But, but for all you need to know is if OD45 is not working, you can switch to OD15S. If it's not working in the sense if it's too slow, switch to OD15S and see if it gives you helpful results. It is something that your system might be stiff, right? So, and again, let's, let's talk about the TCA cycle a little bit. So um, I'm gonna show you the model, but why the TCA cycle model is stiff is, is because in the TCA cycle you have some metabolite pools which are extremely small in size. So alpha ketoglutarate, for example, is extremely small in size in terms of, con in terms of concentration as opposed to glutamate. Like there's like two orders, three orders of magnitude difference. What does that mean? When you have 13C coming in, going back to the example of MRS, alpha ketoglutarate hits steady state extremely quickly. But glutamate, which is a much larger pool, of course to reach steady state it'll take a much longer time. Right? So again, that same sort of logic which I was telling you about e to the power minus 1000 T versus e to the power minus 0.1 T comes in this system. And it becomes stiff. And I'll justify why it is a stiff, stiff system right now. You have these equations uploaded. So this is sort of what the TCA cycle model looks like. And at the heart of it, here are the, all the differential equations that describe it. But I'm just gonna, what I'm do, going to do is I'm going to solve this system with 15S and I'm going to solve it with 45, and you'll see that 15S is a lot faster. Oh, well, not a lot faster in this case, but you can imagine when I have to do like 100,000 of these, then it makes a significant difference. Yeah. No, so it'll be it'll be transient. So, so right, but it, so again, one, yeah, it has to be quickly decaying at, at some point. But also, one has to realize that by changing the step size in a stiff system from a traditional solver's viewpoint, a drastic change in the output could result. That's why it's not able to accommodate a longer step size, right? Because OD45 is able to change its step size. It has the ability to change its step size, but some, the way it's seeing it, when it changes the step size even slightly, there's a dramatic change in the output. And so that's why it doesn't change the step size. You can imagine if you do a little bit more computation, which is what 15S does, then you can actually accommodate stiff behavior. Again, this might sound a little bit vague. You have to sort of take my word for it right now because we're not gonna go into the theory of it. And that's why I gave you sort of the, sort of the rule of thumb, which is if 45 is being slow, switch to 15S. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. And so you can see that here, the reason why it's significant will come from the next example I show, but 15S took about 0.55 seconds, and 45 took about 1.85 seconds. So 15S, and when you're doing sort of the sensitivity analysis that I was talking about, You'll be doing parameter estimation. Each parameter estimation in turn calls like OD, well, the OD solver a thousand times. So if you're doing like a thousand different parameter estimations times thousand OD calls, you, this you know time safe can be critical. Okay. So that's that. So that's about stiff systems. And you might ask, why use OD five forty five at all, right? And the reason to use OD forty five is because it's more accurate than fifteen S in general. And the per step computational cost is lower, right? So OD15S is much more expensive per step, but what was going on with stiff systems is that the number of steps OD45 has to take as opposed to 15S is a lot greater. So, and the re I'm gonna justify that with another script here which I've written which is also available which is called investigate ODEs. And 
here, all I'm doing is I have a simple function which I'm integrating. And we're gonna look at the time it takes for 45 and 15 minutes to solve the system, and then I'm calculating actually the variance between the solutions and the actual function, right, which is a measure of accuracy. And so, what this tells me here is that OD45 has this accuracy, so it's much more accurate as compared to 15S, and that OD45 also takes that. Okay, so that's why you would generally use OD45. We're gonna switch to the last part of the talk now, but I'll stop and take questions before moving on. Is this useful? You think that this might, so this is something, stiff equations you might encounter, as I said, I encountered them when I was uh, doing the CCS cycle modeling stuff, and I think traditionally, the implementation was through 45 and it took a lot of time and I switched it to 15 as a result. Might encounter them at times. It's just good to know that this might, this problem might happen with 45. Yeah? And of course, Wikipedia has great articles about this and stuff like that, so you can go read about it. But the actual math of it is pretty interesting. The, what I was talking about with transient versus long term, if some of you are familiar with eigenvalues, it relates to eigenvalues. Compartment modeling, it's a relatively light topic. Um, and it's kind of, it's, so basically what we're doing in compartment modeling is thinking of our body in terms of buckets. My blood is a compartment, a bucket. My liver is a compartment, a bucket. What is, what is it, it's, which means that the bucket, the way that compartment is defined is that it is well mixed, so my blood, my entire blood pool throughout my body is well mixed, and genetically homogeneous, which means that if, say in the brain, there's some sort of rate at which a substance leaves the blood and goes into the brain, if my blood throughout the body is the same pool, then it does so, at the same, it does so in the same way in the kidney as well. That's what kinetic homogeneity means, right? And so what that enables you, right, once you, ha once you start thinking of your body in terms of just these different buckets, right? You can start doing things like, so going back to the example of MRS, I talked about the infusion of a 13C labeled substance. You're also making constant measurements from the blood of 13C, and you get this sort of 13C time course from the blood itself too. And then if you think of your blood as a bucket, and then you're modeling the exit of this substance from the blood into bodily tissues, right? You can simulate you know, the dynamics of this substance in the blood. It'll be a simple differential equation with an input coming in based on the infusion and an output just based on like a first order exit from the compartment. And so you'll get this exponential thing and you can try and fit it to other buckets. You can build more complicated buckets if you want to. The buckets have no anatomical significance, which should be, which should make sense, but they have physiological significance. They're kinetically homogeneous. And so a compartment model is basically just a bunch of these buckets put together and you specify the rate constants of ex exchange or flow between these different buckets. As I mentioned with the MRS example, so one of, or more of the compartments can represent where experimental measurements are being made, and then you can simulate the dynamics governing the experimental data based on your model, right? And so I think the examples might make this clearer. Here's an example from the literature about doing this for pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to, to the drug. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body, right? Pharmacokinetics means, you know, you would hear about people talking about so sort of doctors having to closely monitor the blood levels for some drugs when they give them. Right? That's pharmacokinetics, right? You talk about renal toxicity, hepatic toxicity of different antibiotics of different drugs, that's pharmacokinetics. It's based on how much clearance is happening, so on and so forth. Um, and so basically, at a long story short, Pharmacokinetic models may look something like this, where you give in a dose into a central compartment, say this is an IV drug that you're infusing or something, 200 milligrams, this is an absorption rate constant. Again, these are like first order rate constants like you have in chemistry. This is exchanging with the peripheral compartment, say tissues, right? this could be blood, this could be tissues. And then there's some elimination happening, say through the liver or the kidney. So you can imagine, this is a very, so, so this is a very black box sort of approach where now you can go in and start writing differential equations, right? So DCP over DT will have an input related to KA, an output related to 
KL and K12 and another input related to K21. And you can write differential equations for this, this, and then when you integrate those differential equations, if you're making measurements in the central compartment, you'll get a solution for the central compartment. You can fit it to data that you might have. This is basically compartment. It's just literally making buckets or black boxes at different compartments, being able to think about physiological systems in ways that only an engineer will, <laughs> okay? So that's one example in pharmacodynamic, uh, pharmacokinetics that comes up, and the practice problem that I've uploaded is a one compartment pharmacokinetic model which involves some intricacies of OD45 when you're doing the integration. So I advise you to take a look at that, and we can talk about it. Another example where this comes up is with PET imaging. How many of you know about PET? What is PET? Or let's hear from there. What is PET? Uh-huh. Okay, let's let's hear let's hear from another person. Yep. So I can quickly explain this a little bit. So MRS, there's no radioactivity in PET. There is radioactivity involved, but the substance you're giving in MRS is in substrate amounts. In PET, is in tracer amounts, very small amounts. So actually, when the first PET demonstrations came, they didn't even need to do mouse models. They could just straight go to humans because the amount of substance you were using was so small. Even though it was radioactive, it didn't matter, right? And so what you do in PET is, as was said, there are different modes of radioactive decay, alpha, beta, positron decay. You choose radioisotopes, which are beta decay radioisotopes. Then you give them in PET, and so this, this isotope, when it decays, is going to emit a positron, it meets an electron, and then two gamma rays come out in 180 degrees, right? That's called annihilation. Then on two ends, you have two scanners. You look for coincidence, right, that these two gamma rays are coming at 180 degrees. You look for them coming at the same time, and you look for both of them being 511 mega electron volts, because that defines the annihilation event. When all of these conditions are met, you say, oh, this specific positron emission must have happened somewhere along this line. And you get thousands of millions of such events, and then you have very complicated reconstruction algorithms which use all of these, and these lines of projection as these are called, and you can actually get the spatial image. That's basically how PET works. And um, it's very useful because MR and CT are anatomical imaging modalities. You see structure in MR and CT. PET is molecular. You could design a radioactive tracer binding to a specific receptor, say a dopamine receptor in the brain, or you could design something you know, that is involved biochemically in some kind of metabolism reaction, and, so it's, and you can then probe the system. So it's actually a molecular imaging technique as opposed to MR and CT, which are more structural. And so in PET modeling, again, um, you have a lot of different types of models Departmental models that can be used to model what? So CA represents arterial blood here. Again, it's a bucket, right? And CA represents, so you're, you're injecting the tracer in the arterial pool. One represents, um, say, tissue where this tracer is coming out. For example, in this three compartmental model may represent Non-specific binding of this tracer, and C2 might represent specific binding of this tracer, for example. And then, based on, again, differential equations and modeling based on the data that you've acquired, you can actually estimate all of these. You can estimate um, binding affinities, for example, of, of, a, you know, of an endogenous substance to a receptor, right? You can look at receptor upregulation, downregulation, again, pretty cool because this can be done non-invasively in humans. You can look at, for example, um, after a specific intervention, have, have dopamine receptors gone up or down in the brain? Again, compartmental models are key to be able to do that kind of model. Another example of compartmental models. And this is just to give you a flavor of another area where compartmental models Pharmacokinetics and PET modeling. And 
you can find yourself playing around and if you search the literature, these papers are easy enough to understand and sort of you can think about even in your own research projects or so on. I found myself during undergrad building a lot of these models myself just to better be able to better understand the dynamics of the system. You can think of even when you're modeling signaling cascades, you can think of it's pretty much a compartment model, right? A concentration pool is like a compartment, it's like a bucket. The actual biological, biological picture is very complicated because you have scaffolds and you have proteins going to places and there's spatial co-localization. Compartment modeling just throws all of that out of the window, right? The simplified view of the actual biological picture. So as I said, differential equations are the backbone of these models. And I have this example here, um, which is we can go through it together, but the reason I have this example is to tell you that you're doing mass transfer in compartment models and not constant, um, or mass balance, you're not doing concentration balance. And that becomes confusing at times, which may be best demonstrated with this example. Does anybody want to volunteer to read this? 